I invite uh, Jeff Torrens to come and uh, share from God's Word with us today. Jeff works with International Student Ministries here in town, and it's great to have you here today. And you've got Michael from the Ukraine, is it? Yes. Is it Russia? Ukraine. Ukraine. Okay. Great. Thanks, Harry. I need that, too. There you go. Uh, we are reading from Matthew chapter 14 today, so if you have your Bible, you might want to open that up. If you don't, hopefully... Uh, My friend Gerald's got it on the screen. Look at that. Because Michael is going to read it for us in Russian. Go ahead. Thank you. So, царь Ирод убивает Иоанна Крестителя. В то время об Иисусе услышал и четверовластник Ирод. Он говорил своим приближенным, это Иоанн Креститель. Он воскрес из мертвых, и поэтому в нем такая чудодейственная сила. В свое время Ирод арестовал Иоанна, связал его и бросил в темницу из-за Иродиады, жены своего брата Филиппа, потому что Иоанн говорил ему, нельзя тебе жить с ней. Ирод хотел убить Иоанна, но боялся народа, так как все считали его пророком. И вот, когда Ирод праздновал свой день рождения, дочь Иродиады танцевала перед гостями, и так понравилось Ироду, что он поклялся дать ей все, чего бы она ни попросила. Наученная своей матерью, девушка сказала, «Подай мне сюда на блюде голову Иоанна Крестителя». Царь печалился, но так как он поклялся перед возлежавшим за столом гостями, то велел исполнить ее желание. Он послал палача в темницу обезглавить Иоанна. Его голову принесли на блюде и отдали девушке, а та отнесла ее матери. Ученики Иоанна, забрав тело, похоронили его, а затем пошли и рассказали об этом Иисусу. Насыщение пяти тысяч мужчин. Услышав об этом, Иисус переправился на лодке в пустынное место, чтобы побыть одному. Но люди в городах узнали, куда Он отправился, и пошли туда пешком. Когда Иисус сошел на берег и увидел большую толпу, Он сжалился над людьми и исцелил больных, которые были среди них. Наступил вечер. Ученики Иисуса подошли к Нему и сказали, «Место здесь пустынное и уже поздно. Отпусти народ, пусть пойдут в ближайшее селение и купят себе еды». Иисус ответил, «Им не нужно уходить отсюда, вы дайте им есть». «У нас только пять хлебов и две рыбы», — ответили ученики. «Принесите все это ко мне», — сказал Иисус. Он велел народу расположиться на траве, взял эти пять хлебов и две рыбы и, подняв глаза к небу, благословил пищу. Затем он стал разламывать хлебы и давать ученикам, а те — народу. Все ели и насытились, и собрали еще двенадцать полных корзин остатков. Всего же ело пять тысяч мужчин, не считая женщин и детей. Иисус идет по воде. Иисус, uh, Jesus is walking on water. Сразу после этого Иисус велел ученикам сесть в лодку и переправиться на другую сторону озера, а сам он оставался, пока не отпустил народ. А когда народ разошелся, Иисус поднялся на гору один помолиться. Наступил вечер, и Иисус оставался на горе. Тем временем лодка была уже далеко от берега. Ее били волны, так как дул встречный ветер. В четвертую ночную стражу, перед рассветом, Иисус пошел к ученикам, ступая по озеру. Но ученики, увидев его идущим по воде, очень испугались. «Это призрак!» — закричали они от страха. Но Иисус сразу же заговорил с ними. «Успокойтесь, это я, не бойтесь!» «Господи, если это ты, — сказал тогда Петр, — то повели мне прийти к тебе по воде. Иди!» сказал Иисус. Петр вышел из лодки и пошел по воде к Иисусу. Но, увидев, как сильно дует ветер, он испугался и, начав тонуть, закричал, «Господи, спаси меня!» Иисус тотчас протянул руку и поддержал его. «Маловерный», — сказал он, — «зачем же ты стал сомневаться?» Когда они вошли в лодку, ветер утих. Все, кто были в лодке, поклонились ему. «Ты действительно Сын Божий», — сказали они. Иисус исцеляет всех, кто прикасается к Нему. Переправившись на другую сторону озера, они сошли на берег в Генесарете. Местные жители узнали Иисуса и разнесли весть о Его приходе по всей округе. К Иисусу принесли всех больных и просили Его, чтобы Он позволил им прикоснуться лишь к кисточке на край Его одежды. И все, кто прикасался, выздоравливали. Thank you.
I'm pretty sure Gerald just learned how to read Russian this morning. Follow along there. Good morning, my name is Jeff Torrens. I work for a mission organization called International Student Ministries Canada, ISMC. Who I work for is ISMC. What we do is called Focus Club. We have focus clubs and missionaries in 30 campuses, university campuses, all across Canada, uh, 45 full-time staff across Canada, talking and reaching out and ministering to international students from all over the world. ISMC is who I work for. Focus Club is what I do. Hands up if you have ever heard or participated in or taken a meal to Focus Club. Everybody's got smiling. Yeah, because it's a fun time. It's a good time. And students are great when you ask them, hey, you need to stand up in front of the church and read. Uh, they say, absolutely. No questions asked. It's great. So we want to say thank you so much for supporting us uh, with your prayers uh, and being here with us. That's us, I mean me, my wife, and Justin, uh, and Joe. It's a great privilege to be here. Where do you put your faith and trust? Maybe better put is who do you put your faith and trust in? I got a picture I want to show you up here that's, oh, yeah. I'm like, I got to start off with a bang. This is going to work. This is Lulu. This is our little puppy. She is cute. Yeah. My, in fact, my wife said she's so cute that uh, maybe we should think about breeding her. And my response to that was, you can have puppies or you can have a husband. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there was a really long, awkward pause. <laughs> before we took her to get spayed. <laughs> That's how it goes in our house. Uh, we took her to a vet that we had faith in. We knew who they were, and we trusted them to do the job well. We had faith that she would turn out great. We put our faith and trust in people all the time, don't we? It kind of begs the question, though, why do we put our faith and trust in some people over others? Why do we trust them on this side of the room and not them on this side of the room? <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> why do we put our faith and trust in certain people over others? In business, there's an old saying, uh, when all else is considered equal, people will do business with those whom they know, like, and trust. Those are the big three. No like, and trust. One of the challenges we have at Focus Club is that uh, students from all over the world, I, I think at TRU right now there's about 80 different countries represented, 3,000 students. Uh, they have lots of options when it comes to who they put their faith and trust in, even spiritually. Our text, Matthew 14, uh, was read very well in Russian. I know you're kind of, you did a great job up there. It's awesome. But it talks about faith and trust, and it talks about three little stories side by side, three little vignettes. And at first, when I read through this and I did my first draft, uh, these three stories were fairly disconnected. They seemed pretty unrelated to each other. They were just simple descriptions of what happened here, what happened here, and what happened here. Uh, and I have to give credit to my small group. I talked to them about it on Tuesday, and they grilled me about my sermon on Tuesday. Uh, and they helped me see a common thread. They helped me create a flow for this morning's message, seeing how these three stories actually help answer a really great question, and that question is, who is Jesus? So if it works, then great. If it doesn't work, then there's a guy named Andrew Jagger that you can blame, <laughs> but he's not here to defend himself, so let's get going. It's curious uh, that these stories happen right in the middle of Matthew. We're chapter 14 of 28 exactly halfway through the book. There's a quote that's going to come on there from N.T. Wright, the Bible scholar, who says, Matthew has put down a marker with these stories, a signpost halfway through his gospel. If this is what happened to the prophet who went on ahead, meaning John the Baptist, then this is what will happen to the one who follows Jesus. John's death points to Jesus' eventual death. Even the resurrection is hinted at here when Herod himself says, hey, this is John the Baptist. He has risen 
from the dead. Interesting choice of words. That's why miraculous powers are at work in him. So this little story, as gruesome as it is, because we thought about just kind of bypassing this issue of violence. But it foreshadows the death and resurrection of Jesus himself. Also starts to answer the important question, who is Jesus? This episode between John the Baptist and Herod occurs in the Gospel of Luke uh, as well. Luke chapter 9, verses 7 to 9 says this, Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was going on, and he was perplexed, confused, because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead. There it is again. Others that Elijah had appeared, and still others that one of the prophets had long ago had come back to life. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear such things about? Talking about Jesus. Who then is this I hear such things about? And he tried to see him. Herod's question is often the question that we get from students at Focus Club. Who then is this I hear such things about? I've heard about the name of Jesus, don't know anything about him, can you explain some things for me? The idea is this, the spread of Jesus' influence sparks interest from all kinds of people. Me and my wife, just before we went to, uh, while we were laying in bed last night, watched that Billy Graham documentary on Netflix. You should watch it, it's good. Uh, His influence sparked interest from all kinds of people. Did you know that he met with every single president of the United States from World War II until the day he died, including the latest? The spread of Jesus' influence sparks interest from all sorts of people. Herod may not have gotten to the point of actually befriending Jesus, but he wanted at least to see him. Before Herod kills John the Baptist, he was listening to the things that John the Baptist was saying. In Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 20, it reads, For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and a holy man, and he kept him safe for as long as he could. When he heard him, he was much perplexed, and yet, it says, He heard him gladly. He had interesting things to say. Interesting things to say about Jesus. So here's my take on it. Your friends will determine the quality and direction of your life. So choose carefully. Your friends will determine the quality and direction of your life. Look at the person beside you and tell them that. Look them in the eye and say... Your friends will determine the quality and direction of your life. Go ahead. And then go to the other side now because nobody knows what to do if you only choose one side. All right. Parents, don't you want your kids to hang out with good kids? Don't you know that good kids can have a great and really good influence on your own kids, not like that Jeff kid who was always lighting fires in the playground. Hands up if you've ever had an influential friendship or partnership in your life, ever. All right? A friend's influence is undeniable. Even Herod the king was not immune to his friend's influence. It says in our passage, the king was distressed because of his oaths and his dinner guests. And he ordered that her request be granted. He's the victim of peer pressure. As much as Herod may have liked John, as much as he may have wanted to meet Jesus, he was ultimately more influenced by his circle of influence than anything else. Same thing can happen to us. So who is influencing your life? And who is influencing the life of your kids? Another idea, Jesus' influence in this world spreads through his church because the way the crowd saw it, when you read the story real carefully, it was the disciples who fed the 5,000. I kind of overlooked that because we think they gave what they had to Jesus, he blessed it, but then he gave it back to the disciples. And he and they, all 12 of them, distributed it to, to the crowd. So if you're way back in the crowd and you don't see what's going on, all you know is that Jesus' representatives, his ambassadors, the beginning of his church, are the ones that are meeting the needs of the people around them. You give them something. That's what Jesus told 
his disciples. They're, they're like, look, all these people are here. They're hungry. They're hangry. We got to do something about this. He says, you give them something. Four little words. I want you to repeat those four words with me. Ready? You give them something. Good job. Do we take ownership of the prayers that we pray? In our text, Matthew chapter 14, it says, when Jesus heard what had happened about John the Baptist, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. I think that's reasonable. Hearing of this, though, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns, and when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. That had to be like an emergency room doctor pulling an all-night shift, one need after another. Can you heal me? Can you heal me? Can you heal me? I know you've just healed 20 people in a row, but this guy who's next is really, really bad. Kids are good at this. They keep asking and asking and asking until they get what they want. Can I have a candy? 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 Can I have a slushy? Can I have a slushy with the candy on top? <laughs> At the very least, it was a day filled with the needs and the requests of help from disenfranchised people at the time. And here's the lesson for us in this. One author says, Jesus transforms his own feelings into love for those in need. Jesus transforms his own feelings. I don't think he was feeling that great after his cousin was just executed. He transforms his own feelings into love for those in need. And it's here that Jesus does something interesting and unique. In verse 16, they do not need to go away. This huge crowd that is hungry, that we've been ministering to all day, you give them something to eat. There's our four words again. You give them something. N.T. Wright on this slide says this in his commentary on Matthew. Jesus is always delighted when people around him come up with ideas or show that they're thinking of the needs of others. But often what he has to do is take those ideas and do something startling with them. Jesus takes ideas, loaves and fishes, money, a sense of humor, time, energy, talents, love, artistic gifts, skill with words, quickness of eye or fingers, whatever we have to offer. He holds it, holds them before his father with prayer and with blessing. And then breaking them so they are ready for use, he gives them back to us, to you, and to me, to give to those who need them. There's a Casting Crowns song that we've listened to lots uh, in our vehicle on our way down to Vancouver, wherever we're going, called uh, Do Something. This is how it goes. I woke up this morning and saw a world full of trouble now. thought, how do we ever get so far down? How's it ever going to turn around? So I turned my eyes to heaven and I thought, God, why don't you do something? Song continues, well, I just couldn't bear the thought of people living in poverty, children sold into slavery. The thought disgusted me, so I shook my fist at heaven, the song goes, and said, God, why don't you do something? And then just before the chorus, it says in the song, God replies, he said, I did. I created you. You give them something. He's inviting us to meet the needs of a hurting world. You see, his church, this church, Summer Drive uh, Baptist Church, the two churches we prayed for, Dallas Barnard Vale, the one down in the coast, it doesn't matter which church you're going to, this is God's plan A. And there is no plan B. My mom told me a story about a time when my uncle and aunt had first gotten married and uh, the house was getting messy and the dishes were all piling up and they weren't able to figure out who was going to do what. Uh, and my aunt, in her infinite womanly wisdom, uh, sat my uncle down and said, look, there's just the two of us here. Who else do you think is going to do the job? It's either you or me. Jesus has unwavering faith in himself and in each of us, by the way. 
Unwavering faith is the assurance that God has the ability to meet and overcome any needs that may exist, often through me or through you. And this is really what it means to surrender our lives to Christ. This is what it means to give our lives to Christ, to sacrifice our wills, to align our purpose with him, to meet the needs around us is never convenient. It's like when you're driving to the lake, you got the whole van filled with lots of beach toys, just you and your wife and your two kids in the back, and one of them pipes up and says, hey dad, I have a question. What is sex? You're never ready for it in the moment. All right? Pastor Annalise Stanley says, there's no cramming for a test of character. It always comes as a pop quiz. <laughs> and to meet the needs of those around us is never timely. It's never cheap. It's often thankless. Yet it's the Christian's calling. You're right, Jesus says. They do have a need. That guy in the Meridian on Columbia Street has a need. You give them something. So what can you give? And what will you give? Because often what can we give and what will we give are two different things. Jesus challenges his disciples, that's us, to spread the influence of his kingdom by meeting basic human needs with God's rich supply of resources. You have no idea the numbers of people that God may want to influence through you. Any person willing to venture into the unfamiliar with even a basic and simple trust in Jesus' claims and commands, we'll discover that there exists no lack with God and his mission. Leads us to the next point. We only really serve freely when we have faith and trust in the one doing the asking. Have you ever been asked to do something and wondered about the person doing the asking and their motives? Sometimes I wonder about that at, at Focus Club. Hey, I want you to come and read the Bible. Hmm, not sure about those motives there. When YouTube first came out, one of the most popular videos uh, was of ordinary people trying out a new sport. This is like nine years ago. YouTube's only like 10 or 11 years old, if you can believe that. Nine years ago, one of the most popular videos going around all of YouTube was a video called Liquid Mountaineering. Liquid Mountaineering was people learning and training themselves to walk on water. It was fake. Of course it was fake. There's no such thing uh, as liquid mountaineering. But in Matthew 14, Jesus is walking on the water. And he makes an invitation to Peter and I think to all of us. He's the initiator. He's the inviter. Come, he says. It says, then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, did some liquid mountaineering, and came toward Jesus. Jesus is always inviting us to do what he asks, regardless of the possibility of our accomplishment. He is looking to those who are willing. He is looking to those of us who are willing. Do you trust him? Why is it that we don't tend to trust the government? (laughs) Uh, They've broken too many promises. They've broken trust one too many times. We have no faith. We have no trust that they're going to be able to run the country as good as we run our own homes. And you will not listen to or respect or follow somebody who can't be trusted. At least you won't for very long. How many of us have ever resisted a prompting from God to do something at least once in our lives? Say I. Uh, it's good, we're all in the same boat. It's fine. When we go and falter, our text tells us we can still cry out, save me. Peter has faith. Save me. It's just not functioning properly at that moment. It's ineffective faith. And Jesus doesn't let us live with ineffective faith. Here's a quote. My ineffective faith often faces the rebuke of Jesus, which is often a combination of rebuke and encouragement. Is that really how much faith you have? Why all this doubt? The moment when we are most strongly tempted to give up is probably the moment when help is if we only knew 
just a step away. Rather than overlook our fears or questions, Jesus invites us to experience him personally so that our fears can be tossed and our questions answered. Take courage, he says. It is I. Don't be afraid. And here's the invitation for all of us. Come on out. So Jesus initiates and invites us to come to him. What is your response going to be? The text tells us the response of those first century eyewitnesses in Matthew 14, then those who were in the boat, this is their response, they worshipped him, Amen. saying, truly you are the son of God. There comes a juncture on the slide in every person's spiritual journey where they must take responsibility for the revelation available to them about who Jesus is and decide. This decision requires faith and a personal trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Any other decision is a rejection of Jesus himself. So I ask you today to decide. If you've never decided, why not decide today? Because I know without a doubt in my life that Jesus changes people. An encounter with the Son of God will leave no person unmoved. Herod asked the question, who then is this I hear such things about? Who is Jesus? My wife talks about having a conversation at work, and uh, that was the essential question. You've got to decide who is Jesus. In our text, the answer is the Son of God. Students that come to Focus Club often begin their journey by asking, what are you talking about? Heard a little bit about Jesus, heard a little bit about Christianity, don't know much. Can you teach me a little bit? Uh, Then we meet a need, a physical need for many students is they're very hungry. (laughs) They're college students and when we say, hey, we've got free food for you, they seem to come a lot (laughs) and repeatedly (laughs) but you know what we are giving them something and then through the invitation uh, I get a message from a guy named Mark Tong Uh, it was on my phone but I didn't want to try and fiddle around Uh, so I wanted to read it out directly but I'll do my best to remember it Uh, he sends me a message it's been two years since he's been in Kamloops so 2015 2016 Uh, He was a student here, went to Focus Club, and then moved away to Ontario Uh, a couple months ago. Sends me a message on Facebook Messenger. Says, hey, Jeff, remember me? And I'm like, you're looking up his profile. Yes, finally. uh, Thank you, Facebook. Now I remember you. Got your face. Uh, Yeah, Mark, I remember you. He's like, hey, do you remember I came to Focus Club? And I'd send back a thumbs up because that's what you do on Messenger. And he says, I want you to know that I became a Christian. Uh, And I got baptized last fall, and I'm living my life for the Lord. So I'd like to say I can take credit for that, but that's got nothing to do with me. It's got everything to do with responding to the invitation of Jesus and making a decision. So who do you trust? Who do you put your faith in? The invitation is come to me. And what is your decision this morning? Ask the team to come up while I pray quickly. God, you do miraculous things so that we would know that you are the God of everything. And we worship you. I choose to worship you whether I feel good or bad or indifferent. That's my decision to live my life for you. I pray, God, that if there is a nudge or a prompting or some sort of feeling for anybody in the crowd today that this is the moment, God, I pray that they would choose you. In Jesus' name.